Hello Space Fans, welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, as two private space firms herald success at launching and landing their rockets while a government loses its prized new X-ray space telescope. Let's start with the bad news. Remember last week, I told you about the loss of communications of the Hitomi X-ray Telescope, also called ASPRO-H, that was launched by the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency? Well, after that episode came out, a couple of days later, the Joint Space Operations Center announced that they were tracking more pieces of Hitomi than they were the week prior which meant that things were not looking good. Astronomers have been tracking Hitomi pretty much non-stop, and, well, the photos kind of say it all. This photo, taken by the University of Alabama astronomer William Keel on Sunday evening, seems to show different pieces of the spacecraft catching the sun as they slowly rotate. The brightest moments are probably caused by the solar panel spinning into view. The pattern of brighter and then fainter light suggests at least two large pieces with different periods are tumbling out of control. One astronomer who's been tracking Hitomi closely, Jonathan McDowell at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, tweeted on Sunday evening, quote, Sadly, I now believe that the radio signals were the dying size of a fatally wounded Astro H, unquote. So what happened to Hitomi? JAXA said late last week that they think the X-ray Space Telescope was damaged by an equipment failure of some kind rather than in a collision. An official of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency said, quote, After becoming unable to stabilize itself, the satellite sustained some sort of damage, unquote. Some of the possible things they're pointing to as possible failures include a rupture of the helium tank that houses the X-ray telescopes or a fuel leak in the stabilizing engines, or maybe it was a battery fault. They also stated that several objects up to a meter wide were spotted floating nearby by U.S. military trackers and JAXA and are highly likely to be pieces of the satellite that have broken off. Hitomi is thought to have lost control of its stabilizing mechanisms and began to spin early on March 22nd, before the parts broke off several hours later. Anyway, regardless of what caused it, this is a huge loss to the astronomical community, particularly those X-ray astronomers who were hoping to learn a lot more about the high-energy universe with this spacecraft. While there are other X-ray telescopes in space right now, NASA's Chandra and New Star among them, Hitomi promised to usher in a new era of discovery by studying high-energy interactions like black hole mergers, neutron star mergers, magnetars, and a whole lot more. So for X-ray astronomers, it was the worst of times. Now next, there were lots of reasons to celebrate this week, though, because earlier this week, Jeff Bezos and his spaceflight company Blue Origin successfully launched and landed its space vehicle called New Shepard. This landing marks the third time they've nailed the landing of their spacecraft. Zero. Lift off. New Shepard is clear of the tower. Several commercial companies, including Blue Origin and SpaceX, which I'll talk about in a minute, are trying very hard to land a rocket so they can reuse it in an effort to make space more affordable. Now, most of the cost of a launch is in the hardware. The engines, the rocket, the control, the guidance systems, all that stuff. And comparatively little of the cost comes from consumables like liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Now, what these companies have come to realize is that most of the cost of a launch is in the hardware, the engines, the rocket itself, the controlling guidance systems, all that stuff. And comparatively little of the cost of a launch comes from consumables like liquid hydrogen and oxygen. For example, liquid oxygen costs about 10 cents a pound, and if you have a big launch vehicle with 1 million pounds of liquid hydrogen propellant, for example, that's $100,000. Liquid hydrogen costs a bit more, but still, more than 90% of cost of a launch is in the hardware. And this is why companies are trying to develop reusable rockets. With millions of dollars going into the launch hardware, it seems insane to just throw it all away and start from scratch each time. Reusing the launch vehicle is paramount to making space more affordable. Now what's weird to me about the idea is that NASA isn't more enthusiastic about this idea. 
They seem very skeptical of the reusable rocket approach, which is weird because usually NASA is on the bleeding edge of technology, but I think they're kind of missing the boat here. Now they seem to get it when they developed the space shuttle back in the 70s. Reusable vehicles made sense to them back then, but now they're going the other way with the enormously expensive space launch system, which uses the same main engines as the space shuttle, which were, as I said, <laughs> developed in the 1970s. Now, Jeff Bezos actually had something cool to say about this back in December. He said, quote, if Von Braun came back from the dead and looked around at our current fleet of rockets, he would recognize them all. He'd say, oh, you're still throwing them in the ocean. I thought by now you'd be reusing them, unquote. And it's true. Not much has changed since Werner Von Braun's time. Now, it isn't clear to me that NASA is doing all of this by choice, though. It was, after all, directed by Congress in 2011 to use the shuttle main rocket engines and then just basically throw them away. Now remember, these were designed to be reused. Now what's confusing me about this, though, is why Congress is telling NASA how to do its job. Well, regardless, though, NASA has never been very good at making space cheap. The shuttle was promised to the public as a means to do that, but in practice it didn't quite work out that way. Over the course of three decades and 135 flights, the shuttle's costs were much closer to $25,000 a pound. It also wasn't as easy to reuse the shuttle as everyone hoped. So the successful landing this week of New Shepard is very exciting for those of us hoping to see a cheaper way to spaceflight. Jeff Bezos said that the rocket they landed this week will be the shortest they ever make, at 80 feet tall. And Blue Origins have plans to make much bigger and more powerful rockets that can scale with size and increasingly reduce the cost of launching stuff into space. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Finally, not to be outdone, just yesterday, SpaceX successfully landed part of their Falcon 9 on a barge in the Atlantic Ocean. So, like we said before, if it ends in a beautiful ball of fire on our platform, that is okay. We're still going to learn a lot from it. So keep standing by here. We'll get you some video stage really, really soon. Um, sounds like stage one is going through its transonic phase through the atmosphere. It means it's heading right down towards that yeah. drone ship. Uh, this, we're on track for hopefully a great landing right now. <laughs> Now comparing these two landings, to me, it looks like SpaceX had the harder job trying to land that rocket on a barge rolling around in the sea. But after several unsuccessful attempts, they finally did it. Elon Musk, the head of SpaceX, is trying to land on the water because he says, quote, for half our missions, we will need to land out to sea. Anything beyond Earth is likely to need to land on the ship. So for anything that's designed to be launched past Earth's orbit and maybe into Mars or into maybe the L2 point, things like that, the rockets are going to have to land on the ship at sea, which of course means that SpaceX needs to develop this technique to be able to re reclaim their rockets in the Atlantic, which they finally appear to have done. The launch marked the successful send-off of 7,000 pounds worth of experiments and supplies to the International Space Station, and it's scheduled to arrive tomorrow on Sunday. So for space enthusiasts, it was the best of times. And for space fans, we live in the most exciting of times. Well, that's it for this week, space fans. Thanks to all of you who have supported SFN on Patreon. And please look at the new rewards that have been added this week. <laughs> and remember, our first Patreon hangout is Wednesday, April 13th. And thanks also to all of you for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Now, don't forget, guys, that after April 22nd, SFN will no longer be posted on the Deep Astronomy YouTube channel, but you'll still be able to get it by subscribing to the Space Fan News channel. 
And the link to that is in the doobly-doo below. So please subscribe to Space Fan News if you want to keep getting it. You know you want one.